Okay, I was asked um, to give you an overview on, on X-ray studies of the properties of black holes. So we're now getting a little bit uh, perhaps less theoretical and um, similarly dirty given that if we look at treating black holes, and that's the ones that we study um, in, in X-ray astronomy, we really have to deal with all of the different um, dirty problems uh, that occur around a, something that I will call a black hole. The previous speaker was a little bit more careful with this, but I'll call it a uh, black hole for the moment. So what I want to show you is uh, first a brief overview on how we can try and study uh, the properties of uh, black holes, um, mainly in the x-rays using what I call uh, relativistic lines. So I'll remind you a little bit about the processes that create x-rays and then how we can do diagnostics of the, the strong gravity region close to uh, the black hole in the center of both galactic black holes and AGN. I'll then show you how we do these measurements in practice. Um, I'll show you that there are a lot of these systems out there that have something that we can infer as originating from a uh, maximally uh, rotating black hole. Um, and I'll also show you uh, how we can use these black holes as tools because the observations are now approaching the point really where we can discuss messy astrophysics instead of the pure, is there a rotating uh, black hole out, out, out there or not. And I'll be ending with uh, a slight outlook on, a small outlook on to the future. This is probably the least politically correct um, statement of the whole conference will be done somewhere here, at least I guess for some of you. Um, so uh, let's go back to astrophysical black holes. And just to remind you, we really believe that we, we know two types of black holes. There are the active galactic nuclei and the so black holes in the centers of galaxies with masses on the order of a million um, to a billion solar masses and luminosities that are comparable to the luminosity of the host galaxy. So these are systems where about one to two solar masses of material per year falls via an accretion disk, probably from a reservoir that's called the torus, onto uh, a black hole and on the way to the black hole the material loses its potential energy in the form of radiation which in the end we can observe. These accretion disks that form around the black holes in the inner regions, in the inner few uh, short-shell radii, have temperatures that on, on the order of millions of kelvins, and that means that they radiate mainly in the X-rays, and therefore we need X-ray observatories to, to study that regime. There's also a second class of black holes, and that second class is probably as important as active galactic nuclei for our understanding of what's going on around these systems. And that's the so-called galactic black holes. So that's the remnants of supernova explosions of very massive stars. And we end up uh, here with black hole masses on the order of 10 solar masses and luminosities of 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 solar luminosities. We can observe these systems uh, if they are in binary systems and if you have a more evolved star um, or a, a massive um, O or B star that, that has a strong wind. In these cases, material will, uh, will go over into the potential well of the, uh, of the compact object and again get accreted through an accretion disk. I emphasize these two types a little bit. I'll be showing you more uh, results from galactic black holes, not a lot more, probably 50 50. Um, there are three other talks about, um, about black holes at this conference in that. that that are being observed by Blanford, Bonatari, and Gensel, they mainly concentrate on, on the AGN. The reason for this really is that accretion flows, so the stuff that falls down here is self-similar, um, um, are, are self-similar, so in principle the accretion disk here and the accretion disk here has the same physical properties. There's one big difference between these two systems, well, the two really, uh, the most important difference is the typical time scales that are involved by looking at AGN versus galactic sources. If you just do the, the trivial um, Newtonian approximation for time scales close to the innermost stable circular orbit, you find that this is uh, less than a millisecond for a solar mass black hole. Uh, so that means that if you look at these systems here, 
you're really able to study the long-term behavior of the accretion flow under the black hole. So its environment changes dramatically over the lifetime of a typical gradient thesis. Um, so these are good to look at long-term effects. And I'll show you examples, for example, that if you look at spin measurements, that you can measure with the same black hole the spin in different, uh, in different situations of the accretion flow, which then gives you trust in, 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 in the, uh, the precision of your measurement. On the other hand, these systems, because they are much slower, um, really you can study one individual property in very high detail with many more photons than you could ever collect uh, for the same frozen instance in time uh, for the galactic source. So both systems are very useful because they give complementary information. In one, we have the long-term evolution where the black hole doesn't change. In the other one, we have one state in time. Thankfully, since we have so many AGN, we can study their, their statistical properties uh, by just looking at a lot of them. So um, this is a typical spectrum. And from the high signal to noise in these data, you see that this is a galactic black hole. This is the X-ray regime that's accessible to modern satellites, like, for example, the Japanese Sasaku. Um, new star now from NASA or XMM Newton and Chandra, which mainly measure up to 10 kilonometer volts. This is a black hole Cygnus 6 one, the most famous of the galactic ones. And you see here that the spectral shape of these sources can change dramatically. Um, this source is often in this state here, which we call the hard state, because most of the emission from the accretion flow <coughs> is emitted above 10 kiloelectron volts. This is the state where you have a lot of high energetic photons being produced in the equation flow. About 20% of the time, the source is in a state where the spectrum looks like this. This is the state where thermal radiation from the accretion disk dominates. So where we really see uh, that material close to the black hole is in an optically thick medium and can radiate uh, a, a plankton. And these sources change back and forth between these, uh, between these two states. The first thing, if you want to understand the black hole, is to understand the processes that produce this emission. And there are really two observational consensus there. One is that if you model the spectrum above 10 kiloelectron volts, you can describe it with an exponentially cut of power law. So uh, the observed flux goes like e to the minus some index times exponential mean minus e over default. Um, I should say here in these figures I often um, show the frequency multiplied by flux multiplied by the frequency, which is a measure for the total amount of energy radiated uh, in, in this band. So this gives the energetics, not really the, the photons. You see here from the larger error bars that these measurements are very difficult because generally this, this photon index here goes like uh, this gamma is around two. So for one decade up in flux, uh, for one decade up in energy, you go down in. Uh, by two orders of magnitude in, in the signal that, that you get. Um, we also sometimes see additional hard radiation above 200 kiloelectron volts. There are detections of these sources to above uh, the NED range. At lower energies, um, we see, as I just showed, the, the disk emission from the thermal disk and the continuation of the power law. And often, so in this case, where the disk is, is uh, faint, you mainly see the power law, which then is modified by absorption in the system. This is the lines here. That's mainly the stellar wind of the companion, and also the interstellar medium. And as a rule of thumb, we really can't observe these guys below 0.5 kV or so, because the galaxy is, uh, is just infinite apparent um, to X-rays in that regime. The general idea of what's producing this radiation is uh, that we probably see compromised radiation where soft photons that might be produced in the accretion disk, for example, get caught and upscattered in a hot thermal plasma. And it's fairly easy to show, companies did this, for example, in the 60s, that you do get a power law spectrum that then turns over uh, at around the, the temperature of the electron gas. So uh, from the exponential cutoff, which is at about 50 to 100 kV, we can, we can immediately say that this is the typical temperature also of the hot gas that's producing the hard uh, radiation. What's less well known 
is um, where that compromising gas is really located. Uh, there are pretty much two models. One is called the sandwich corona model, where you have hot electrons that sandwich the accretion disk. Another model, which has been called a lamppost, or blob model, or a jet model, locates the hard radiation in a jet, so in a relativistic outflow where some of the accretion flow is uh, ejected away from the compact object at speeds close to the speed of light. Both models, as I'll show you uh, in, in this talk, give comparable descriptions to the overall spectrum. So at the moment, we don't know which of these two models is correct. And one of the big questions in, in observation of black hole astrophysics is the question really, what does this flow look at, exactly look like? <laughs> now, I've shown you that irrespective of whether the hard radiation is produced somewhere here or down there, we have an optically thick medium, the accretion disk, next to a source of hard photons, this corona thingy. Now, what happens if you have um, these two things together? You get the same thing that is done in, by, in, in applied physics if you irradiate x-rays uh, onto a surface, for example. So, let's take the hard photons, um, here the, the power law spectrum from simplicity, some of them will be intercepted by the optically thick medium in the accretion disk, which is cold, meaning it is, has in the inner parts temperatures that are much less than, than a million kelvins. And that means that um, these hard photons here now come scatter of low energetic electrons. Now the relative energy change uh, during the compton scattering, delta E over E is minus E over NAC squared, and that means that hard photons can very efficiently get Compton down scattered, and since during the scattering they change direction, they might emerge from that disk, but at a lower energy. So the red photons here go downwards in energy. This works up to energies of about 1020 kV. For normal material of solar composition, below that energy, the interaction cross-section is such that photoabsorption dominates. Above that, it doesn't because photoabsorption goes like e to the minus 3, while uh, the Compton cross-section or Thompson cross-section is, is roughly constant. And that means that the soft photons that hit the disk are mainly absorbed in the inner shells of the, uh, of, of the atoms that are in the disk. So as the sum of these two, were, since we can't um, distinguish between this uh, blue so-called Compton reflection hump and the primary continuum, what we really predict to see is a spectrum that has a slight curvature here, the so-called reflection spectrum. Now in addition to um, photoabsorption, since the photoabsorption events also liberates an inner shell electron, you also get fluorescent radiation. So if you irradiate the disk with hard x-rays, you get strong fluorescent lines, and just because of the good fluorescence field of iron and the high abundance of iron, the most prominent line that is predicted to be seen is the uh, RNK alpha and RNK beta fluorescence lines at 6.4 kilometers volts. Now, we are looking at a system that is irradiated, but so far I haven't spoken uh, about the motion in the accretion disk. In the accretion disk, the iron atoms and everything else will move in Keplerian orbits, circular orbits, and then only very slowly change the radius inwards. So when we observe the iron, we don't see the iron uh, line emission at 6.4 kiloelectron volts, but we did see it affected uh, by relativistic effects. And this is one of the many different versions of pictures of an accretion disk. Here it's color coded uh, the red or blue shift of material in the disk here around a non rotating uh, black hole. And now you have to imagine that at each of these locations here, you do have iron atoms that are emitting. So what we see is um, we see the sum over the whole disk because we can't, uh, we can't resolve it. And that means we see a broadened feature, a uh, broadened line feature. And because uh, the, the broadening is a combination of gravitational redshift and special relativistic effects like beaming, um, you see a very asymmetric profile here that is strongly dependent from our viewing direction onto the accretion disk. 
So this is shown up here. What you see here is that if you look at the disk from the top, you essentially see a narrow feature that is slightly um, redshifted with respect to 6.4 kilo electrovolts, just because of the gravitational redshift. Well, if you look at the system from the side, you see a higher, larger component of the velocity coming towards you, and therefore the line broadens. And because of um, special relativistic boosting, you see that the higher energetic peak uh, for example, in this profile is stronger than the fainter energetic. So you get a kind of triangular shape, uh, shaped feature. The profile of the line is also influenced by the spin, and this is where the curve metric, for example, uh, strongly comes in. And one of the results that uh, we will uh, learn in undergraduate relativity is that if you look at the closed orbits around a black hole, the innermost stable circular orbit is a function of the angular momentum of the black hole. So this means that as you, uh, as, as the black hole changes its spin, the inner edge of the accretion disk uh, varies. Um, and this is nicely shown in this uh, famous figure here. And now if you go from a maximally co-rotating black hole, so where the black hole and the disk rotate in the same direction, to a black hole where the accretion disk and the, uh, and, and the momentum of the black hole are counter-rotating, you see that you have a fairly strong dependence on that inner, of that inner edge of the disk. Now from the inner edge onwards, the material here falls very rapidly into the black hole. And that means that all of the emission that we are going to see just comes from the disk itself. Now, this means that since the innermost stable circular orbit is such a strong function of the, inner rate, uh, of the angular momentum, the line width, which tracks the maximum speed of the material in the disk, is a strong function of the spin. This is shown here for one inclination angle, and uh, it shows you fairly clearly that uh, the triangular profile gets much more peaked uh, the, the smaller the angular momentum. So this is pretty much what we try and use to measure uh, to, to measure uh, black hole spins. There's a last factor that obviously enters all of these line profiles, and that is the question for where is all the iron fluorescence emission? Um, and that's often parameterized using the so-called disk emissivity, which one often first writes like a like power law, so you assume that most of the X-rays, for example, come here at the inner, from the inner edge of the disk and less and less from, from outer regions. That's an assumption. That is the astrophysics, and I'll show you how we can constrain this, this astrophysics here. So the trick with observations now is we have, in principle, three parameters. We have the inclination, we have the angular momentum, uh, and we have the emissivity. The question is, can we use the observations then to describe the line profiles? This is uh, very historic data done with um, a very ratty instrument, which was state of the art at that time, obviously, of MCG minus 63015, published by Tanaka um, almost 20 years ago. And what they found in, in, in this galaxy was a very broad feature um, in the iron band. What's shown here is of the line flux, so uh, they modeled the continuum and then subtracted off the continuum just to show the line. I'll show you more realistically what lines uh, look like in a minute. They found that uh, during this observation, um, the source was strongly variable, and during the fainterest phases when the continuum was really gone, they got a very broad profile, and that profile was so broad that you could only explain it uh, with speeds that are so high that one had to infer that the accretion disk must be around a maximally rotating black hole. Now, um, this is historic data, and I'm not sure whether I would dare to publish such a line today because this is a very noisy thing. So thankfully, um, after um, ASCA, we had a large number of newer instruments with higher collecting areas, and therefore that would give us much better capabilities to measure these lines. Here's work that I did, for example, is the residuals, if you just describe, so the ratio between the data and the model, if you try to describe uh, an observation of the source just with a power law, and you see it doesn't work. If you then model the soft emission, which is caused by the disk, 
you get a lot of these things left over, and then you can go and describe that feature with a mission from a disk, and that gives you this broad component here, uh, which is consistent with the line that comes from a disk where most of the iron emission is very uh, from very close to the innermost stable circular orbit. Um, the emissivity in the disk falls very strongly proportional to r to the minus 4.6. The narrow feature here, which um, one could also see here in these line and in this observation, is clearly resolved as a narrow as a real narrow feature. And we don't think it has anything to do with the flow close to the black hole. That is fluorescence from material in the torus that's far away and that we just can't separate from, uh, from the relativistic broadening. Um, longer high resolution observations uh, were, were, were made uh, of the source, for example, and also the Suzaku satellite, a new Japanese satellite to, that was used to exclude calibration problems. Um, and you see here that the line profile is measured with both XMM and Suzaku, so two satellites perfectly agree. What's the nice thing of Suzaku is that Suzaku also has <coughs> instruments that work above 10 kilowatt volts. With the broad lines, one of the technical problems that we have is that um, the XMM mirrors don't reflect X-rays X that well above 10 kilowatt volts. So you are trying to describe the shape of a broad feature, and you essentially have no data above that feature. So if you diddle a little bit here with the location of the power law, you, you can get very different iron line fluxes. So technically, it's a big problem, and the only handle that we can have to this is by adding data to, uh, from, from above 10 kiloelectron volts. And this was done in these observations here, and here you see uh, the, the evidence for the, for the reflection hump uh, in, in the system. That pretty much excluded other explanations for that broad lumpy, uh, lumpy feature than, than this. And if you just look at the statistical error, Assuming that you really have a flat accretion disk and so on, one can measure a black hole that's essentially maximally rotating. Now, MCG minus 6, 30, 15 is one of the clearest cases, but we have about 30 cases where I think there is no doubt that we see broad features uh, that we can only explain with emission from, um, from, from a disk around a, a, a black hole. Um, here are just some examples. You see they essentially all look the same. You always have this lumpy feature here. Uh, you often have the neural component from the torus and so on. Uh, and you often have, um, and, and, and then you have this double peaked uh, profile. All of these data can be described really only with such relativistic lines. If you want to take a look at how many sources have what's been and so on, there's a very nice uh, review by, by John Miller that was published in the annual reviews of astronomy and astrophysics in, in 2007. Um, one of the interesting things, and there will be a uh, talk about this tomorrow, is also where does the spin come from? So the astrophysics question is where these <coughs> black holes born with high spins, or did they obtain their spin, for example, through accretion? Um, the theory why this is so interesting will be described tomorrow. This is just a teaser that shows you that, for example, if you take all very faint AGN in some of the deep fields, um, here, here the Lockman hole, um, and redshift correct them and then add them up to get a feeling for what, they, what the line looks like, you'll get, get a broad skew symmetric profile that indicates that they are really relativistically important and also indicates the spin history uh, of, of these systems. So this is the AGN. Um, and at this point in time, a lot of astrof uh, astronomers really were convinced that these are uh, relativistic lines. There is one technical problem, however, and that has to do with the fact that for technical reasons, um, above 10 kilo electron volts, um, you usually have to use a different detector than below 10 kilo electron volts. The reason for that is that a traditional X-ray mirror doesn't really reflect X-rays above 10 kilo electron volts, so you have to use some kind of a collimated instrument to measure data above that. So you really look at data that comes from a different region because uh, the collimator is essentially looking to a toilet paper roll. Um, and, and, and has a field of view of half a degree or so. So you can collect a lot of stuff there that's not from your black hole. 
Um, and that's one of the reasons why often the cross calibration between these two instruments is not very good. So um, you, you have to, to introduce not well understood calibration constants uh, in, in all of the modeling uh, that I've showed you so far. Now this has stopped with uh, the launch of the new star satellite, which uses uh, a different type of X-ray mirror. Uh, and with this one, now we have a, a first observation of an AGN where the same instrument was used really from below 4 kilo electron volts to 60 kilo electron volts. So where you see the reflection and the relativistic line at the same, uh, at the same place. This observation shows that the previous fitting results really did agree with, uh, with, with what we have here. So I think all other explanations that people were doing, like for example, strong broad uh, absorption edges and so on, really are dead by this observation. Uh, the same features we also see in, in black holes, and I don't want to bore you too much with too many of the spectra now, they always will look the same, you have this triangular feature plus some reflection here. Um, but we really have about now 20 measurements also for galactic sources where we get very high signal to noise lines as well. So we have a whole bunch of features, they all seem to be the same, have, have the same origin. Uh, and often we would try a maximum of rotating black holes to explain the features. Um, but not all is good. And one problem is there are also AGN where we don't see broad lines. Um, and I just said we have about 20 or so AGN. We have a similar number, if not larger number, where we have no evidence uh, for, for broad lines whatsoever. And this has often been used as a criticism uh, against the relativistic interpretation of these features. Um, but it's really more mainly, or about 50% of why we don't see broad lines in these systems is a soci sociological reason and not a physical reason. The reason is if you look at the data, we know uh, from, you, you can just simulate and see how many photons do I really need in order to be able to detect a broad feature with an X-ray detector. And the number is uh, 200,000. The reason is just that you are looking over a broadband in your detector and you're looking for fairly small deviations uh, from the continuum. Um, so this is uh, a, a list made by Matteo Guanazzi where he plotted all of the AGN observations and the strength of the line. And you see that a lot of the AGN observations that we have with modern instruments just don't have enough photons. And the sociology of this is, if you sit on an observing panel, the big question is, are you going to approve an observation for one colleague that takes 500,000 seconds, or are you going to approve 10 observations with 50,000 seconds that also have interesting things uh, to, to do with their observations? And so there is a certain bias towards observations that are too short for this type of work. The um, missions have recognized this, so uh, both with uh, Chandra and XMM, there are now a special categories for long duration, very valuable uh, observations that must have a minimum of 500,000 seconds and longer. So in recent years, we had a lot of high resolution, uh, high signal to noise measurements of lines coming out of these, these projects. So far, I've just spoken about the iron line, but that's obviously not the whole truth, because if you irradiate uh, a disk, what you really get is not only uh, the iron line, but you also get a big forest of lines from other, from other species uh, that, that you need to, uh, need to observe. And if you irradiate your disk with hard x-rays, you also deposit a lot of energy in the disk. <coughs> so the disk is not really cold, but the disk gets ionized, it gets heated up by the material that's hit, that hits it. So now we are in the regime where we can do astrophysics with these observations and see whether the better physical models for the disk still give the same result for the, uh, for, for the black hole properties. Now, uh, this is a sequence that just shows you how the spectrum, and remember we are mainly interested in this, in this band here, how the spectrum, the reflection spectrum changes as the flux on the accretion disk uh, increases. This is a function of the ionization parameter which is essentially the number of photons available uh, proportional to the number of photons available or per hydrogen atom. And so you see just if you have very high irradiation, you completely
completely irrigate away all the lower Z elements. So they can't absorb anymore. And that means that the, that the continuum here goes up, while at lower ionization, you really have a forest of lines that you have to take into account. Now, this depends a lot on the astrophysics of the accretion disk. You need to do a lot of very advanced uh, radiative transfer calculations to do such, uh, to do such um, calculations. For some of these lines, for example, we did special experiments at Lawrence Livermore Lab just to, to get the line energies right and things like that. But we now believe that we really understand um, the, the, the ionization structure of, of these disks. Now, so what you really observe is you take the spectrum and then convolve it with the velocity profile that I showed you before to produce the predicted observation. Um, and this is shown here for a few examples for positively and negatively um, spinning black hole. Um, a second astrophysical question is that so far I told you uh, that Comptonization from the corona is uh, really the thing, but as also previously mentioned, a lot of AGN have jets, so they have magma outflows. This is uh, uh, the highest resolved um, jet that, that we know so far, so you can see structures here that are smaller than the light here um, in, in, in Centaurus A. <coughs> And this jet could also irradiate the equation disk. Now, um, this then leads to the so-called lamppost models. So imagine you have the black hole, you have the disk around here, and you have a block of X-ray emitting material sitting on top here. Now, some of the radiation, just if you propagate uh, this uh, through space-time, will again hit the disk um, and, and, and then do the reflection. Now, whether the source of X-rays is close to the disk or far away really doesn't matter for the reflection shape as long as the X-rays hit the spectrum. Uh, but one of the nice things of these models is that one of the freedoms, namely that how much line emission do I have as a function of distance from, uh, from the black hole, is, is now replaced by uh, just the physics of light bending close to the black hole. So you can calculate these trajectories. For example, you can also put in that this block might here be moving, so you'll get a beaming away from the disk, and that then gives you an irradiation profile um, shown here for different heights of this block above the disk onto the disk. And that then you use to predict the emissivity of the line and try to compare that with the, with the observations. The nice th feature of these lamppost models here is that they very naturally predict the very steep emissivity profiles that the previous studies that I showed you found. All of these studies found that uh, the emissivity decreases with radius, with distance from the black hole, faster than r to the minus uh, <coughs> 3. And that's just the slope that, that, that we see uh, here. So this is the fit of a lamppost and also of a, of a jet model Two signals in one. It's the same data that I showed before uh, here. And the, the, in terms of a reduced chi square, the description of the data is, this, uh, is equally well in both of these two models. So we can't exclude really that it's the jet that is the irradiation rather than, than, than the corona. The nice thing is of these models, however, that the deduced spins are independent of this astrophysics. So if somebody tells you, oh, we don't know the accretion flows, we need to, <coughs> this is a big systematic error. It's not. To about 0.05 or so, you get the same spin out of there. And the discussion really, right, whether you measure point, point 0.85 or point 0.9 or point 0.8 is rather academic, because there are many more <coughs> things that we don't understand um, than, than these slight differences in, in this way. Now, I showed you before that uh, galactic black holes have time scales that humans can understand. And we can use this to check the consistency of our results. <coughs> so, this is a decomposition in terms of a jet model of a spectrum of Cygnus in <coughs> one. You see here in green uh, the reflection component as reflected off the disk using a self consistent. Um, reflection model that includes the ionization structure and also a uh, broadening. Uh, the, the violet line shape is uh, what we deduce for the line shape from the source. This is a perfectly nice model uh, of the data that gives us a spin that's larger than 0.95 for, for, for 
with the system. Now we have four observations of this system, <coughs> and these are kind of fair contours. So that shows you the the two relevant fit parameters here: the spin uh, and, and, and here the inclination and the height of uh, of the block above the disk. Um, and they all yield the same result for the spin. So even though the accretion flow has changed, right, the geometry is different in all of these systems, we always get smack on the same value for the spin, which is good, right? I mean, we'd rather not do a measurement with 0.01 that the spin is 0.95, and a few weeks later if the spin is 0.5, that would be embarrassing and probably unrealistic. Uh, but that's not what we find here, even though the continuum are very different. So we're stable against, uh, against the astrophysics. Um, concerning the broadband uh, reflection spectra, we now not only see uh, the broadened relativistic ion and K-alpha lines, but we also see uh, relativistic broadened lower energies. For example, here in 1H0707, a wrong measurement done by, by Andy Fabian, where, again, the spin was found to be uh, maximally rotating. This is one of the examples where in the literature you see that this broad line here could also be explained with, uh, with broadened absorption here. But again, with these reflection measurements that I showed you before, that explanation is uh, not viable anymore. Um, again, for this source we have multiple observations. These are two observations of the source. The continuum change, spin change, spin doesn't change. Perfect. So, the spin does not change over variability, but the sources are variable. The question is, can we use variability, perhaps, to make further progress in our understanding of the big question of this, what, what does the accretion flow look like? Because that's a major systematic. The answer is yes, you can do that uh, with so-called X-ray reverberation. Here's the accretion disk, black hole, uh, we as an observer, and now let's assume a block go uh, in the block, some x-rays get produced. Now, we see some of these x-rays directly, but some other, of the, some, some other x-rays get uh, intercepted by the accretion disk, reprocessed there, and then uh, re-emitted in our direction. Now, the light travel time here is different to the light travel time here, so we see the response of the disk after the initial signal. Now, obviously, we can do that for the whole um, for the whole disk. So what we really do is that as a response to a delta function signal, we see a continuum of response um, from the disk. So we need to so if we see primary variability, and if we know this type of a transfer function, we can disentangle the reprocessing um, from from these initial measurements <coughs> and. Um, that has been done. We know fairly well for different geometries what exactly these transfer functions look like. And we also think that we do understand the way how uh, the variability gets introduced into the system. You can build up stochastic models that show how propagations fluctuate in this disk using a uh, proper um, Novikov phone type um, calculations. Um, and we have also first indications that we see indeed this type of a reprocessing and this type of response in the measurements, even though we are not good enough yet to really measure the transfer functions directly. That just has to do with photon starvation. We don't have enough signal to, to do that yet. What I show here is for two sources, one H0707, the one that I showed you previously, and IRS 13, so-called time lag measurements. This is just as a function of Fourier frequency, the difference between uh, the, the, the soft and the hard of that, and you see that they get negative. And that means there, there is a delay between the reprocessed thermal radiation and, and, and the hard X-rays. We see this both in AGN and also in, in galactic sources. Um, so the nice thing here is um, the timescales that we get are compatible with typical timescales close to black hole. Right? 800 seconds and so on. <coughs> It's just what you would expect if you have a blob sitting above the black hole and then, uh, then the light coming, coming to us. 
So this gives us the opportunity to really probe the shape of the curved space close to the black hole directly in, in observations. Although, one has to say, these measurements are still very complicated just because the flux is area. Um, so your typical count rate from an AGM now is a few counts per second if this thing is bright. So if you have a delay of 80 or 100 seconds, you don't have that many photons to play with. Uh, it's a stochastic process, so you have cross-correlation methods and so on. We can do a lot, but we're really at the limit right now of what we can do here. We also see, by the way, that there is a lag in the iron band. And the nice thing, this is shown here, and the nice thing for that lag is that also the variability of points in the iron band is fairly broad. What this tells us is that really this big lump that was rather difficult to see in the data is coherently doing the same thing. So it's really not a modeling problem, but it's really photons that know that they come from, from the disk. Um, so this is another proof that the line, the broad line really is, is, is one feature. Um, in galactic sources, this is uh, more difficult. The reason for that is just that they vary too fast. Um, but also here we do see evidence for reprocessing in the software to do this to see this um, soft response as in the AGA. So in the last two and a half minutes, um, I would like to show one other consistency check and then a little bit away on how we can go forward. And that consistency check comes from the fact that we also have the accretion disk in the system. So far, we've used the disk only as a thing that reflects or fluoresces um, X-rays, but we also know their its properties very well. This is the emissivity of an accretion disk as a function uh, of the spin parameter, and the emissivity of the disk and its temperature is essentially just a function of how much energy do I need to liberate in order to move from one distance to the next. It's a trivial first-year undergrad problem to calculate that. And we can measure them. Um, this profile in the data if we have data that are completely dominated by the, uh, by, by the accretion disk. And a lot of galactic sources are completely dominated by the accretion disk, at least for most of the time. Here's a famous example, NFC X3, one of the two uh, black holes in, in the Large Magellanic Cloud, that very often shows this type of a very hard spectrum. Now, you can use the spectrum and infer directly the uh, innermost uh, the, the inner radius of the disk, and since the source is variable, you again can do that at different phases of the uh, of the uh, different different ge uh, accretion geometries. And what you see here is that very rock solidly, we always get the same value in, in, in these measurements. Um, this has been done by McClintock's group uh, at Harvard and others for. Uh, a large number of black holes, and generally to about 0.1 or so, these results agree with the iron line measurements. So, how do we go forward? I need to show an Athena slide here, even though this is probably not what you would like to see. But I hope that the directors uh, won't kill me for this. I told my people to look for me in the lakes around. Um, <laughs> um, so, one way you go forward is you have a larger collecting area. One of the ideas of how you can do that well, is you need to build a new X-ray observatory. One way to go forward is to do focusing optics. Um, this gives you two to two and a half square meter, and that will allow you to measure broad features out to high redshifts. So also to measure the evolution of spin as a function of uh, as a function of redshift. That's a very interesting astrophysical problem, as you'll see tomorrow. Uh, it's also a very expensive astrophysical problem. I also showed you lag measurements. This is what we can do so far uh, with an instrument that has more collecting area in the soft. You can do <coughs> lag measurements exactly enough that you can directly probe the transfer functions. So you can really measure, okay, oof, light travel time to us and, 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 get, the, and get the right result. And because the detectors are so much better, we can do much, much better in galactic sources. This is a simulation of the galactic center, as it would look like uh, with Athena. <coughs> Up here is an iron line for a typically bright, uh, for a typically bright uh, galactic transient that goes off in the galactic center region. And if you can't do something with this line profile, I really can't help you anymore. 
An alternative would be to do more timing, and there's another mission also called LOFT. That is very good for galactic sources, so something like this it couldn't do because of source confusion, but for isolated um, black holes it could do similar measurements because it has 10 square meters of area, but it couldn't do anything uh, for AGN. So with this, I'll pop up my conclusion, and I thank you for your patience. Thank you.